Thank you so much for joining us, Hatim. I really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, uh, I just wanted to ask you about your venture in uh, VLAN. I believe like that was the pinnacle point of your career. And that is what everybody remembers you by, right? Well, uh, it all started with uh, Dr. Michel Fatouche, my partner and myself in 1991, inventing uh, a Two technologies, really, but uh, the, uh, the first one was the what's called WOFDM, and that basically solved the problem of high-speed communications at a low price and a reasonable size. So uh, with that, we decided to, uh, you know, file the patent in 1992, and in 1993, we started operations in YLAN Inc. in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. And basically, the purpose was to build the first uh, high-speed Wi-Fi uh, wireless LAN product, and that was the name of the company, Wireless Local Area Networks, uh, shortened mm -hmm. to YLAN. And uh, in 1993, by October, we developed the first prototype, which operated at 20 megabits per second. And in, uh, we took, it was big, it was the size of a shoebox. And by 1997, we had uh, miniaturized it a bit to, so that it would fit on a uh, PCMCIA card back then, you know, the, the ones that got uh, inserted into computers yeah. or laptops. And uh, by about 2000, we had a full-blown uh, product uh, that we called the WLL, uh, you know, 2400, which was a uh, 20 megabits per second, 2.4 gigahertz product. And uh, well, kind of the rest is history. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is, uh, how do you actually explain the concepts of these these technologies? Like uh, wireless internet, yes, of course. But when it comes to 3G, 4G, 5G, and now we're talking about 6G as well, uh, people just have an idea that it represents speed of internet, you know? So, but... In technical terms, so what actually is this 3G, 4G, 5G, and all that? Uh, in, you know, let's uh, talk about uh, the Wi-Fi first, and uh, you know, and then we can, you know, extrapolate to other technologies. Um, yeah. The basic premise uh, of this technology is, you know, um, when we send uh, data over a wireless link, the uh, and let's assume the data is bits. Um, each bit would have an echo, you know, it would go direct from the sender to the receiver, but then it also can hit a building and come back, can hit another building and come back and can have multiple reflections and come back, you know, or go to the, from, you know, uh, there's many, many paths between the transmitter and the receiver. So one bit can have multiple reflections of itself affecting, you know, the uh, bits that are after it. So mm -hmm. uh, it's called multipass effects and, and multipass. The, uh, the, the idea is if you have, for example, uh, let's assume one gigabit per second, a bit then is only 10 to the minus nine of a second. And, you know, it affects then, let's say uh, the, the echo is five milliseconds. You can imagine it's affecting five million bits. And to remove it, you've got to do five million squared, like 25 trillion mathematical operations in that one nanosecond. So it's impossible to do today. Mm -hmm. So what OFDM does is that it breaks the, path, the, the signal into parallel path. So instead of one gigabit per second, let's say we now have uh, a thousand, uh, 10 megabits per second. The 10 megabits, you know, uh, if you square that and, uh, you know, you'll find that it's much more efficient than mm -hmm. the one gigabit sent on one channel. And the, the, the processing becomes possible or feasible. Uh, I know it's a bit, you know, uh, complex, but uh, that's a simple uh, explanation of it. Yes. So uh, in, in 3G, it's not, uh, well, let's say, in Wi-Fi and in LTE, long-term evolution technology, mm -hmm. and 5G, 
in, in these technologies, it was uh, multiple kind of FM channels. So you have um, in Wi-Fi 64 adjacent channels, all assigned to one user. In uh, WiMAX and in LTE, it's 256 channels assigned to one user. In 3G, it was not uh, what's called FM channels or radio uh, you know, frequency bands. It was a spread spectrum signal. It was a signal transmitted over many, 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 uh, or, or an extended band. And that mm -hmm. signal was coded. So it's adding multiple codes together. And, and that, again, is more efficient than sending you know, one fast code. Sure. So now when we, when we are talking about 6G, it's just a more advanced version of 3G, is it? No. Four, 5G and 6G are more related to what was called the WiMAX technology. And WiMAX was purely o OFDM. You know, uh, 3G was and, and 4G are a bit of a mix. Uh, 3G is pure uh, CDMA and uh, five, mm -hmm. uh, 4G was a mix. Uh, the, uh, the, when the base station talks to the phone, it uses CDMA. And when the phone talks to the uh, base station, it uses OFDM. 5G and 6G are pure uh, OFDM. Okay. And uh, what is 6G then? Well, 6G, there is no real proposals yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Nokia has talked for a while and uh, the China Huawei talked for a while about, you know, doing one trillion bits per second and uh, blockchain and things like that. But there is no concept, mm -hmm. uh, that, no clear concept. Myself, I am pushing for a variation uh, or a flavor of 6G that I'm, you know, uh, I'm trying to make it very inexpensive. So I'm using mm. Wi-Fi as a standard for mobile. Wi-Fi in mm. its uh, native form cannot be a mobile standard because of two reasons. The, 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 the range of Wi-Fi is very short. And the second is um, when you talk or when a phone is connected to a Wi-Fi router, it keeps communicating with that router until the signal dies, and then it looks for another router. This is what's called the lack of handover. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if you are closer to another router that has a much better uh, reception and transmission for you, you don't connect to it. You keep using the router you're connected to. So we invented the technology we called Wi-Fi soon that does hand over in Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the user experience with Wi-Fi uh, is at least 10 times better in speed than without this uh, Wi-Fi soon technology. The, the, the short range is solved with what's called mesh uh, Wi-Fi. So with me between mesh and Wi-Fi soon and, and blockchain, we can make very inexpensive networks. And that I think is more important because like you said, everybody associates the different generations with higher speeds. I am interested in lower price so that we can mm -hmm. get the 40% of the world that don't have internet and don't have communications, we can get some good communications networks. Yeah. So for, for this kind of network, you would need a specific kind of infrastructure as well, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, 5G was, uh, of course, its own infrastructure. Um, the good thing about 5G is that it opened the door mentally for people to accept very short-range uh, access points. You know, like in, in uh, 5G, the range is about 200 meters. So it brought it closer to the Wi-Fi, and it made Wi-Fi more acceptable. Uh, mm -hmm. 5G has a lot of problems because it's an, let's compare to Wi-Fi, it's an immature technology. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi is, you know, has been around for 20 years or over 20 years now. So um, the, 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 you know, Wi-Fi is, is a much better candidate for, uh, you know, 6G than an extension of uh, uh, 5G. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned about uh, giving this technology, promoting it for the more developing uh, side of the countries, right? 
yes. let's let's take Uzbekistan for it uh, as an example. At the moment, uh, Uzbekistan is trying to be a much more uh, g- going to uh, like a a more developed country, uh, and from a developing nation towards a developed nation. So in that scenario, uh, how do you see te- these technologies moving forward? Because at the moment, if you move out of capital cities, there is a, a lack of infrastructure, definitely. So how do you see what, what should be the steps which a uh, country can actually implement to develop good infrastructure and g- provide better service to the uh, to the whole of the country, let's say. Uh, you know, um, this is a very good example of what I, I was talking about. Um, you know, the, the, the and the the heart of this the problem you described is the economic viability of the network. So, if you build a four G network or a five G network, and let's remember, every generation is more expensive than the generation before. Yeah. You know. So if you build those uh, 4G or 5G networks, it's going to be far too expensive and not viable, not economically viable for the uh, rural areas. If you use Wi-Fi, like, and, and of course the suggestion is to use a mix of 4G and Wi-Fi. So the roads get covered by 4G, but the dense area or the denser areas get covered with Wi-Fi. And, uh, you know, like we can say that uh, one square kilometer uh, will not cost more than maybe $12,000 with Wi-Fi, whereas in 4G that could be, you know, in the, you know, tens of thousands, like, you know, Mm -hmm. closer to 100 or 200,000. Let's just recap, just so that a layman like me can understand, right? Uh, What we are talking about is uh, we build something like Wi-Fi boosters throughout the country, and we connect those with the 4G or 5G technology that the government is going to be implementing. But in the majority of the centers, we provide uh, Wi-Fi boosters to boost those signals which are going to be connected with the 4G and 5G. So it will be like a overlapping technology to provide better internet. That is exactly the concept, but I, I will add to it a, a sort of two small twists. Sure. So one twist is to use uh, small servers as exchanges, as the central offices. You know, every uh, network mm-hmm. has many central offices. So we use a blockchain, small computers that can do all the operations of a big central office server. And, you know, but it's only you know, $1,000 or so. And it can cover, you know, 20,000 users very comfortably. So it makes the network scalable. If you don't have the density mm-hmm. of the population, you don't need to spend a million dollars on an exchange. You can just put mm-hmm. a $2,000 uh, server. So we use blockchain instead of the uh, blockchain, like decentralized servers instead of one big server. And we use mesh Wi-Fi. Now, the Wi-Fi does not need to be all owned by the operator. You know, you can use people's own Wi-Fi in their homes. You can use, uh, you know, a network of Wi-Fis. And with that, we share the revenue with whoever is providing the hardware. So it's a, a very interesting concept where you involve people in the network. They own pieces of the network and they get revenue. So you allow a lot of uh, what in America is called moms and, moms and pups, you know, kind of businesses. So people can have an, an extra source of uh, revenue by managing the Wi-Fi in their neighborhood. Mm-hmm. What about uh, places where there is more agriculture going on? I see like a lot of countries are trying to develop their uh, f- uh, farmable areas and trying to uh, develop, uh, you can say, like technological advancement in their farm uh, side as well. And they're trying to use Wi-Fi technologies to operate different machineries as well, to automize a lot of uh, sectors in agriculture. So in countries like Uzbekistan and all, they are agriculture-based countries as well uh, because they have a lot of farms. How can this actually be implemented over there? Because you would see like large areas of lands with just one house maybe, you know? 
No, this is a, another beautiful example, and, and I'm glad you mentioned, uh, you know, what's done in, uh, let's say, North America. Um, of course, in North America, you know, uh, agriculture is very, very uh, mechanized and automated. So you've got this big tractor or combo, you know, that goes mm -hmm. in and uh, at one stage it can plow the land and in another can it can seed it at the same time. Um, when it's harvesting, it actually goes in with GPS and very accurate positioning and, you know, it just goes... Uh, you know, in uh, lines and, you know, does the harvest of, uh, you know, um, 100,000 uh, acres in a few days. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the use of technology in agriculture and in particular Wi-Fi is perfect because uh, in an agricultural land, we can e easily reach two kilometers with a Wi-Fi router. Uh, if we have, you know, just a, a moderate height uh, pole, you know, like a, a, a three meter pole and we put an antenna on it, we can reach two kilometers with ease. So mm -hmm. you can cover a very nice size farm with, uh, you know, very few Wi-Fi uh, nodes. And, you know, we can cover the area very well and we can do positioning and, and everything with the Wi-Fi technology. So, you know, it, it is almost a perfect example of what I was talking about. Because Wi-Fi can, you know, support many, many things. It can support agriculture, it can support remote education, it can support remote health. So, you know, it, it's very uh, suitable for a lot of uh, applications uh, in, in a developing country. That I was very curious about is how does this technology, like I've seen like a lot of, because I believe like Wi-Fi signals are something like radio signals, right? Uh, would they be? They would. Uh, would they actually contradict with uh, other signals? For example, like if you uh, put uh, a router on, let's say, like an electricity pole, because a lot of these developing regions uh, in Central Asia they have like big poles for electricity, right? So if you put, I'm just assuming, like if you if we put routers on top of those, would they contradict with it? Because it, I believe, like if we can. It could actually save a lot of cost for uh, individual poles, you know. Oh, no, absolutely, yes. We can use uh, the the electricity towers, of course, you know, with all the safety precautions. But you know, we mm -hmm. can use electricity towers uh, for uh, you know Wi-Fi as Wi-Fi towers. That is very possible. There would be no interference between the two. When it uh, when you were mentioning about Bitcoin, how? Actually, uh, AI is going to be involved in the new technology now when it comes to communication because I feel like this this year is definitely uh, ca uh, categorized as the year of AI. So how do you see that in being involved in communications? Communications, computing, um, shopping, uh, you know, and health and education and uh, you know, all these are merging together, you know. So who, um, not who, but, um, you know, which part of the network is closest to the user? Well, it's the operator, mm -hmm. you know. The operator knows at all times where you are. If they can listen to your, to your conversations through your phone, they're the first that gets that information. So the operator has a lot of information on the user. And with AI, they can sort of predict the behavior of the user. Like, you know, this helps, for example, in network uh, uh, capacity share planning and so on, and in, in capacity sharing and moving users from one uh, access point to another because we know uh, their behavior. Uh, you know, uh, in, in what I described earlier as Wi-Fi soon, we use AI where... Uh, we know then from previous experiences that uh, the user, you know, will move from here to here, and uh, you know, so we don't need to wait uh, for him to uh, to let to let us know that uh, the, the the signal is better. We know the signal is better with another router, and we move him automatically. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of uh, uses for AI, but I say, you know, it, the merging of all these technologies is happening, like. You know, the communications uh, is not just about, uh, you know, sending a bit from point A to point B and back. It's more about now the use of the information. And, you know, uh, 
it's very important point. Of course, information is the new uh, gold mine or the, go the new gold or the new oil. Uh, information is the most important commodity in the world. That's true. Before we end our conversation, is there anything that you can predict like this year uh, to be the game changer for your technology? Is there something that you are working on and you feel like this is something that can actually change the, uh, the direction of the work that you are doing on? Well, the, the most important thing we're working on is this Wi-Fi soon. And uh, as I said, it will make Wi-Fi as a viable mobile standard. And that's a very important milestone in communications. Um, and I'll explain why. I'm talking to you now through a 5G phone, and uh, the 5G portion of the phone costs the phone about $70. The 4G portion of the phone costs the phone about $10, less than $10. The Wi-Fi costs the phone $1. So you can imagine uh, making a, a, a mobile standard purely based on Wi-Fi would bring the cost down of phones, you know, maybe to... $30 or $40 of good quality phones, you know. Uh, so this is a very important step, this Wi-Fi soon. Um, the second one is introducing AI into uh, communications. And I say that's happening all the time now. Like, you know, it's already happening in the network. But we are trying to bring it closer to the user where, uh, you know, we want to predict the user behavior. We want to predict... Uh, you know, uh, his shopping needs, um, you know, like instead of you going on Amazon or another uh, Alibaba or something to buy your uh, products, we would know what you need. Because if we can hear you through the phone like Google does, and if we know, uh, you know what you were looking for, well, we can find it for you. You know, you don't need to search mm -hmm. by yourself. We don't even need to recommend to you if we are operating in your best interest. The problem yeah. with companies like Google and uh, Facebook and so on is your interest is the least of their interest. <laughs> you know, yeah. they are serving themselves. They're not serving the user. I you think know? this is one of the reasons why there are a lot of uh, public cases against these, con uh, these companies. And I think this Absolutely. will be the biggest problem. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So and I, I believe that this this would uh, be the biggest problem and the biggest hurdle in getting the licenses for uh, and the permissions for this technology to uh, to be viable for every phone. We are hoping that this uh, Wi-Fi sort of revolution, because um, very much like blockchain and, you know, the cryptocurrencies are people's revolution into currencies because Countries' mis mismanagement of finances has led to every country being so much in debt that, you know, the, mm. the economic system of the world is bound to fall and fail, you know. So yeah. very much like that, Wi-Fi would be people's revolution into telecommunications where we own pieces of the network. You know, and we get we share the revenue. It's not just a, a money printing business for big operators that we all can share in the business and we all can build together. So um, and, and we can all own our information, which is the key point. If you don't own your information, you will not exist in five years. Yeah, that's true. Thank you so much, Hatim. I really appreciate your time. And uh Good luck for your uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, Zoom uh, soon, sorry, <laughs> and yeah. uh, hope to see it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Faizan, and yeah. uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you.